All right, now is the time of our service where kids can come forward. Kids of all ages are invited to come up at this time. So if I could have the kids join me up front, that would be great. Awesome. Good job. Come on in. Have a seat. All right. All right, there's room for everybody. Come on in. It is so good to have you guys here with us today. We're excited that you're here as we start what's called Holy Week. We know that this is Palm Sunday, and for today, we're talking about how Jesus was anointed. Now, anointing, if you didn't know what it was, in Old Testament times, someone would take a substance and rub it on their head, usually, as a sign of being set apart for the Lord. And so to illustrate that, I need three volunteers, three brave volunteers. One, <laughs> two, three. Come on up, guys. Right over here. We'll have one. We'll have two and we'll have three. All right, so kind of move over here. Very good, very good, very good. All right, I did a little shopping. And so we're going to do a little Bible knowledge exam today. Now, in the Old Testament times, if you've read your Bibles, they used a substance to do some anointing. Was it A, whipped cream? Okay. All right, and right here on the instructions, there's instructions for anointing someone with whipped cream. So here we go. Here we go. I anoint you as ruler over all dessert toppings. May your ice cream never melt. Very good. All right, so that's option A. Very good. Is it option B, cheese whiz? And, and in the same way, there is also some directions for anointing on here. All right, here we go. I anoint you as magistrate over all processed foods. May your crackers never get stale. Very good, very good. Or is it C, olive oil? Are you ready for this? It's really good for your skin. It is. Okay, and there's also some directions for anointing on here as well. I anoint you, master over all Italian foods. May you never overcook your pasta. All right, and of course we always have to have, Judah, can we have a D is also an option. So raise your hand if Old Testament times people use whipped cream. Asher, you need to read your Bible more. Is it, is it B, cheese whiz? Trevor likes cheese whiz. Or is it C, olive oil? You're correct. It is C, olive oil. Now, as we illustrated, in today's passage, a woman anoints Jesus, not with whipped cream, not with cheese whiz, but with a special kind of perfumed oil. Um, and so I tried to get some really expensive oil. Uh, can we see it, please, Gina? So this was the most expensive perfume I could find. Each little vial is $3,000. And when I put it in my cart and put it in the church debit card, for some reason a message came up saying, you are not approved for this purchase. <laughs> so we had to use just family fair olive oil. But here's the thing. The amazing perfume that was anointed on Jesus' head was done not so that he would, could reign as our king, although that was part of it. But Jesus says, what you've done for me is something amazing because you anointed me for my burial. And what we're going to find is that's why Jesus decided to come to earth. Yes, to reign as our king, but also to give his life for you and me. Let's give our volunteers a round of applause. Trevor, you have hand in hand. I want you guys to be clean. Trevor's got some wonderful baby wipes, right? So go ahead and reach in there and get a baby wipe. All right, if Mike could, if um, Miss Jamie and Miss Renee can help with the other kids, get some uh, Smarties there. Very good. If you attend preschool through first grade, you can head to rest stop with your parents' permission. Great job, and you can ask for your, your parents for help as well. Good job, guys. All right. If you're a guest with us today, normally I don't put food items on people's heads, but I think that's really a good illustration for the importance of the unique anointing that we're going to see in today's passage because we are just about to wrap up our wonderful Lent season series called Rediscover Christ. Now, maybe you've heard the phrase Jesus Christ, and you think, well, Christ was Jesus' last name, wasn't it? Actually, no. Christ is a biblical term from the New Testament 
Based on an Old Testament word, Messiah, both mean anointed one. And why is that so important? We're going to look at one of our confessions today. Judah, can we see it, please? That asks, well, why? Why is Jesus called Christ, meaning anointed? It's because he has been ordained by God the Father, who has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who fully reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our deliverance, and our only high priest who has delivered us by the one sacrifice of his body, and who continually pleads our cause with the Father. And finally, what we're talking about today, he was also anointed as our eternal king who governs us by his word and spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. And so as Maria pointed out in her announcement time, today is also Palm Sunday. The Sunday we remember when Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem, the crowds were cheesing, cheesing. <laughs> I got cheese whiz on the brain, I'm sorry. Cheering, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were laying palm branches on the ground. Now interestingly, in the Gospel of John chapter 12, that gospel writer includes today's passage immediately prior to what we see as the triumphant entry. And so we need to reflect on that and understand that just like last week, in order for us to fully understand today's passage, we have to look at an Old Testament parallel. If you remember, all of God's people, they wanted a king. They wanted to be just like their neighbors. And God said, you're not going to like having a king. And they're like, no, we want to be like everybody else. So what did they do? They gave him King Saul who was absolutely terrible, by the way. And after he rejected God, God said, okay, I'm going to find somebody new. I'm going to find someone after my own heart. And so they sent the prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse. And that picks it up, Judith. we see it? So he sent for David and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, so it's probably something similar to this, some olive oil, and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And so in the Gospel of Matthew, next slide please, instead of being anointed with oil to reign as the earthly king over God's people, Jesus was about to be anointed for his true mission, which was to give up his life for you and me. And so keep all this in mind as we look at today's short passage. It will be up on the screen, starting with verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. Now when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Now aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And so to set the scene, imagine disciple and his closest friends, Jesus, are gathered together. And then the text points out that they were in the town of Bethany, which is outside of the city of Jerusalem proper. Because remember, everybody was there for the Passover, so there was really no room for them. And so when they would eat, they would actually recline on the floor. So there was a really low table that they would eat at, and then actually kind of lay on it like this, and they would eat Imagine that's probably not very good for your indigestion. I know it would give me heartburn. But here's the thing. We think and scholars believe that Simon, who is a former leper, is the father of Jesus' close friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And so even though Matthew doesn't point out, some scholars believe that this was Mary at her dad's house who did this. So, so they're, they're gathered together. Jesus knows that he's headed to the cross and in the middle of this meal, this woman comes to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. And you think, well, how expensive was it? Other Gospels point out that it was the equivalent to a year's salary for an average 
laborer. So imagine for a month, think in your head what you make if you're currently employed in a year, and ask yourself, would it be good stewardship to buy really, really expensive perfume, the equivalent to one year's salary, okay? That's how valuable and expensive this perfumed oil was. And yet this woman, knowing how valuable it is, breaks open the glass alabaster and pours the entire contents on the head of our Savior. Now, how are we supposed to understand this? In the middle of the meal, here she interrupts and she's pouring oil, perfume on his head. How do we understand it? Well, Judah, can we see that next slide, please? We see that this action has a twofold meaning. Jesus equates it with the rituals that accompany burial. We'll talk about that in a moment. And so acknowledges women's traditional role. But anointing the head is also a sign of a royal commission. And thus the woman is cast here in the untraditional position of priest and prophet. Later Jesus proclaims that the women's prophetic action will be preached universally. And so somehow, some way, this woman understand that this was the right thing to do. That this is what God was calling her to do. That this was a way to honor who Jesus truly is. And yet again, the disciples missed the point. They see what this woman does, this extravagant act of worship, and they start picking on her. The text says, and Matthew was there, he probably felt it too. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. They were furious. And other gospels point out that the loudest of them all was Judas, who later betrayed our Lord. But they, they scold her. They say, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price than the money given to the poor. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but sometimes when we're called to do what God has told us to do, sometimes we get picked on for it. Sometimes we get made fun of. Maybe in school or at work, there have even been times where you knew what God wanted you to do, but you didn't want to get picked on. You didn't want to get made fun of. So imagine for a moment how that woman is feeling while these disciples scold her for doing exactly what she knew she had to do. And they raise a really good practical point that that money, a year's worth of wages, could have been used for other purposes like giving to the poor. Now, were they factually correct? Of course. But the disciples were thinking about only earthly things. This woman was thinking of heavenly things. And so aware of all of this, understanding the implications, Jesus understands what's going on. And instead of scolding the woman, rebukes the disciples saying, why are you bothering this woman? She has done, I love what the message says, the wonderfully significant thing for me. The poor you will always have with you. Now, this is one of those verses in the Bible that people often quote but rarely fully understand. What Jesus is saying is that there is nothing that we can do on human means to stop poverty. There's nothing we can do to stop suffering. There's nothing we can do to stop pain. But what Christ is always calling us to is to be in the midst of those who are suffering. For example... A couple years back, I took a really good class at United Way called Bridges Out of Poverty. And we, we read at how many people with the best of intentions go into an area stricken with poverty and say, you know what, you people, you need to roll up your sleeves and get a job. And it doesn't work. And because of that, they leave frustrated and angry and disappointed. And the model that we've seen throughout Scripture is that, and I love what this, this training gives us, small little stepping stones that we're called to walk alongside someone who has only known poverty and help them take small steps to better and a healthier life. And so what we see in this text is, yes, the poor will always be with you. The government over the years in our country and others has spent a whole lot more money on the war of poverty than just a year's salary. And what happens? We still have to wrestle with it, but we can minister in the midst of it. And to contrast that, he says, but you will not always have me, knowing that he will physically be going from their presence. And what she did when she poured the perfume, verse 12, on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. And so think about all the connections here. If you remember that on Good Friday, when Jesus hung on the cross, he gave his last breath and the sun was going down. And it was against Jewish custom to have a dead body hanging 
as Sabbath began. And so what they did is they rushed the process, they got his body down, they put him in the tomb, and they didn't have time to properly prepare the body of Jesus. They would do that with oil, like what we saw in today's passage. But also, keep in mind that on Easter morning, the women, and maybe this woman that was mentioned in the text is one of them, hurried to the tomb carrying different spices and, yes, oil, to finish the job they couldn't a few days later. And of course, they found an empty tomb. But one last connection. Remember the beginning of Matthew when three wise guys, the wise men, came to visit baby Jesus and they brought three gifts that were fit for a king? What did they bring? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that same word myrrh is used in today's text as Matthew describes what this woman anointed Jesus with. And we understand the significance of this because Jesus finishes saying, truly I tell you, whatever, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she's done will also be told in memory of her. Now, I don't know about you, when I'm long gone, when I am with my Lord, I hope that I just have a small measure of the reputation this woman has. A reputation for doing the right thing even when it's hard. A reputation for extravagant worship. A reputation that says no matter how valuable something might be, nothing could compare to honoring our Lord Jesus in this way. So think back to the children's illustration. All right. All right. Um, Austin, did you get your head clean? Okay. Good, 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 good. Oh, good thinking. Okay, good. And uh, oh, no more whipped cream on your head? You're good? Not really. He's still a little bit bitter about his anointing. And uh, Natalie, you okay? Yeah. Again, Scott's probably like, you smell like an Italian restaurant, right? But here's the thing. As Maria often points out when it comes to communion, the source of the power in anointing is not anything special. Remember, just like in communion, the Lord uses ordinary things for his extraordinary purposes. And so even to this day, people are anointed. Sometimes they're anointed to be set apart for a special mission. Sometimes they're anointed asking for the Lord's healing. And so if you ever say, you know what, I'd really like the pastors of this church, the elders, to anoint me for an important part of my journey with the Lord, we'd love to do that. Okay? But the thing is, when we think about anointing, we know that this tradition not only carries on to today, you have to understand what it signifies. Because the oil itself is not special, we are not special, but yet the power that the Lord brings when we do that is where the special is. And so, as we saw last week, Judah, can we see that next slide, please? Remember, Jesus went and sent the disciples out, and when they went out, they preached that people should repent. The disciples drove out many demons, and yes, they even anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. And so here we see that as Jesus' representatives, that's us today, they learned that his power extended beyond his personal presence. Remember, Jesus said, I'm not always going to be physically here with you. For their mission showed the coming of God's kingdom. Anointing the sick with oil is unique to Mark. This use of oil was both because of its medicinal properties and its symbolic value, indicating that the disciples acted by Jesus' authority and power, and there it is, not their own. And so thankfully for us today, all of those people who are found in Christ have the greatest anointing of all. Just like King David, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so when you think about that, as we return to our confession, we see that after describing why Jesus is called the Christ, the Anointed One, we see the very next question asks, but why are you, and you, and you, and you, and you, called Christian? Can we see it, Judah? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so there it is, I share in His anointing. I'm anointed to confess His name, to present myself to Him as a living sacrifice of things, to strive with a free conscience against sin and the devil in this life. And afterwards, there it is, to reign with Christ over all creation for eternity. And so that's what we know. That's what Scripture says. And it's backed up by our confessions. But sometimes you don't feel it. When we look at the year that we have had as a nation, as a world, as a church, a year ago, we weren't able to gather together. 
Many of you have experienced great loss in this year. Many of you are still grieving the loss of a loved one. Sometimes it doesn't feel like Christ is on the throne. Sometimes it feels like we're all alone. Because if he was truly on his throne, why would he allow these sufferings to continue? But we have to understand, when he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he wasn't coming to reign as an earthly king. He was coming to reign as our eternal king. And so we live in this in-between time where his kingdom has already come, but not yet in its fullness. And so we are called by God to behave as though he's already here, because we know he is through his spirit. And yet the rest of the world has no idea that they too need to worship the king who's on the throne. And so in closing, there's a book Maria's been reading for her ethics class. She's like, man, you understand? This is the point of the book. What do we do in this meantime when we're waiting for Christ to return? Jesus would have said, of course, that it's the present world, the beautiful broken world we, we see, still see suffering that is upside down and inside out. He was coming to put it the right way up and the right way out. That shift of perception is the challenge of the gospel he preached and lived and for which he died. So, how do we respond to this important truth? And T. Wright continues, human beings were called at last to, there it is, rediscover what they had been made for, what God's people were created for. They were, after all, to be rulers and priests following Jesus' ultimate royal and priestly achievement. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we want that truth that we have begun to reign with you even now to be a reality, not just a theoretical, biblical truth that we get a good grade on a test, but no, we want to actually live knowing that you are our king. We want to live knowing that your kingdom has already come, though not yet in its fullness. And so on this Palm Sunday, Lord, help us to have the perspective to know that not only will we reign with you for eternity because of what you did for us on the cross, defeating the powers of sin and death and rising from the grave, that we, Lord, are your faithful subjects, given your anointing of the Holy Spirit to go out into the world and declare that you are our King. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.